Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Wow. November in the garden, my favourite month, fireworks oh, yes. coming up very shortly. Yeah, just All after, good fun. After after Halloween of, uh, of October. Yeah, yeah, pumpkins and mm. ghouls. It's lovely. I, I like the autumn. Yes. I think yeah. autumn colours... Mm. It's been, to me, it's been a bit late this year, Chris. I most, don't know what your observations are. Most definitely, and certainly at the garden centre, I just walked past uh, some rather nice Japanese aces, which have finally and finally started to give us uh, that wonderful show. But uh, no, you're right. I think the the wet weather and the mildness of, uh, se- sort of September and October haven't uh, haven't helped. Excellent. So, what's on in the garden, or what gardens can we go and visit? Indeed, it's a it's quiet month this November, Peter, unfortunately. However, there's two really good things. Uh, okay. One actually opened last week, on the 27th of October. Right. And it's over at the Museum of Cider. I didn't know there was such a place. A Museum of Cider. <laughs> now, that sounds like we should be going there. <laughs> yeah, Where is it? It's, it's in Hereford. Surprise, okay. surprise. Proper uh, place to have a... Cider Museum, isn't it? Indeed. And the exhibition's called uh, A Variety of Cultures, and it's basically an explanation of how cultures across the globe have taken apples and made it their own in very important international artworks uh, in Herodia. So what we're getting is some of the the best um, artworks from Australia and also from the Botanic Gardens at Kew, Mm. seen for the first time outside London. So this is a... Sort of a, a real, real coup for um, the the Museum of Cider down in in, in Herefordshire. So, mm. yeah, um, a nice art exhibition to go and look at. Then. Indeed, yes, uh, and that goes right through till January next year. So it's a it's a long one. It's a, it's, it's on a, a good long run until the twenty eighth of January twenty twenty four. So uh, if you're in that part of the world, yeah, go and make, have a look. Make it a date. Yeah, because I'd learned something interesting about apples mm. the other day. Um, okay. My uh, daughter was asking where to, uh, could she grow a Granny Smith apple? Okay. And I was like, well, you can't grow the seed because they might not be pure sort of bread and equally once you did grow something, you'd then have to graft it onto a quince rootstock or something. Mm -hmm. Um, But do you know where the Granny Smith comes from? I don't think it's not this country, is it? Is no, it? Is it's it? Australia. I, oh right, I, I, and I, I, I didn't realise they yeah. grew and bred you know, Granny Smiths down there. But apparently, yeah, it's eighteen fifties, eighteen eighties, or right. something like that. It ah. was you know, sort of found. Mm. It, um, it's a cross between a domestica and a. Uh, 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 is it rustic? Uh, What's the standard? Um, Wild cops, apple, um, uh, Malus uh, uh, S- Sylvestris, I suppose. Malus yeah. Sylvestris, that yeah, was the one. Yeah, so yeah. yes, and uh, like yeah. most apples, it's a crossbreed. But yeah. yeah, so that particular variety doesn't grow particularly well in the UK, I suspect. Granny Smith, but it just needs that uh, that bit of needs extra warmth. Needs the warmth. That's what I yeah. said to mm. Freya. Is yeah. the fact that mm. yeah, essentially, it's it can be a really quite mm. I say sour apple. Yes, it's, um, yeah, if it hasn't had the sunlight that it needs. So yeah, possibly not the best one to buy in this country. <laughs> really hot, Stick yeah. to your coxes; they're yes, the best did, in yeah, my yeah. eyes, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah, and then a little bit later on in the month, uh, Peter, we've got another uh, wonderful event organised by our friends at the National Garden Scheme. Okay, it's their annual lecture for this year. It's on the th- uh, the twenty third of uh, November on Thursday. It's a live event. And it's um, it's hosted by uh, a gentleman who is the correspondent for the Financial Times. He's been a, he's been their gardening correspondent for fifty years, right? Uh, and that's uh, Robin Lane Fox. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, well known in the world of, of gardening. He's he's a, a very uh, sought after person in the way that he he knows his history, and he's going to do a, his annual lecture for the National Guard Scheme on uh, what gardening uh, visiting does to us. So. Um, okay, which sounds could be an interesting lecture then. Indeed, um, and that's uh, it's a ticket, a ticket, a ticketed event. We'll put the uh, uh, the, the the link on the, our show notes. But uh, yeah, it's it sounds really good. You can go, you can watch it live, or you can you can download and stream it as well. So if you're not in London, mm. it's a good event there as that's well. That's a good idea. So you don't have to actually go all the way to London. We can just get it online. Yes, yeah. brilliant, nice one. 
So, what's been in the news then? Mm. I, I hear the National Trust have hit the headlines with mm. a tree that got felled. Yeah, very, very sad, wasn't it? And of course, that mm. happens right through the, the month of October. And uh, well, we, we have to give it obviously a little bit of lip service, don't we, Peter? Because it was a well, it's a beautiful of, of tree. tree. I mean, yeah. some of the images that the mm. photographers had taken oh, over the years were fantastic. incredible. And yes. I mean, to have a a gap named mm. after the sycamore that lived at the top of it. It's, I mean, it's a yeah it iconic did. tree, the old sycamore you know, yeah. gap tree yeah. in yeah. Northumberland. That's that it. Is yeah. no more. It is, and of course, it's been felled, uh, obviously, by people who have obviously too much time on their hands, shall we say? And uh, it's, yeah, uh, or yeah. angry, angry um, land uh, land renters just, because they didn't even own the land. From no, what indeed, I understand. no. Uh, so what has happened, uh, obviously, the, it was obviously felled. It was felled in a very professional way. The chainsaw was used in a, in a, in a, a way which is hopefully going to encourage it to coppice from the base. It is a sycamore at the end of the day. So, yeah, yeah, so I suppose yeah. it will grow from the base again. Mm, and yeah. hopefully if they trim round mm. the sort of stalks that come out and just leave one, you potentially yeah. will get a whole new tree with just one leader and it'll make a lovely one, new tree again. One hopes so, don't we? I mean, we do. We really want it to, to, to live in and live on and reimagine itself, I suppose, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Um, well, it's got a good rootstock. So. It has, yeah. And it was in the, the National Trust, uh, after it happened, said that the actual tr- the heart of the tree was in very good health, which is okay. encouraging. The logistics, they've obviously cut the tree down now. They've cu- cut it into, into pieces. It's now been moved to a, a secret National Trust location. It was nearly right. two and a half tonnes of wood, so wow. we'll wait to see what that wood's going to turn into. I suspect, um, knowing the National Trust, we'll, we'll find something very beneficial. Coasters and placemats, possibly? Maybe. That would be a good or, one, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah. uh, some nice, uh, some, uh, something will hopefully come sure. out Indeed. of it, yeah, which yes. is good. Yeah, a phoenix will rise from the ashes, as they say, don't they? But, yeah. you know, it, I, I must admit, when it, when it uh, was announced, I did have a look on, on YouTube and, and saw, obviously, famously made, uh, famous with by Kevin Cosner, in uh, Robin Hood, and the the the, the uh, clip they show on YouTube is quite a long clip, and it, you know some of the actors were actually climbing into this tree, so it is that iconic, and that's why mm-hmm. the Americans, obviously, as much as the well, as Brits are, are obviously fell in love with it as a as a, a wonderful living monument. Well, it certainly mm. was that. I mm. think it was, yes, yeah, like yeah. you say, sort of yeah. stood out on the horizon beautifully. <laughs> yes, yeah. So. Um, yeah, and then, then I suppose whilst we're, we're talking about the National Trust um, and obviously trees, I'm going to move on on our just to, to link it a little bit. The actual tree of the year uh, was a, uh, announced. Okay, because, what's that? So it's a sweet chestnut. Fair enough. So, yeah, yeah, um, and this links the story that the Sycamore Gap tree was tree of the year back in 2016. So you know, yep. like, yeah, before the, it was obviously felled. Um, last month, but yeah. So the um, this this uh, sweet walk- chestnuts are yeah. nice, though, aren't they, Chris? I can they remember are nice. I, I, my memory is as as a child mm. walking through the forest of Dean. Oh right, because there was always my. Me- I mean, I'm sure there's loads everywhere. They're not that uncommon, are they? Mm. But no. they. Uh, it, such a good tree because you you could pick the nuts and yeah. um, mm. uh, take them home and roast them. Exactly, and the yes. smell of a roast oh. chestnut. Yes, I mean, glorious. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, and and this this particular tree is old. It dates back to fifteen thirty nine. So it's been around for, a, you know, it was back. It was stood since the reign of uh, Elizabeth I. So it's got wow. a lot of history. Gosh, if mm. a tree could tell tales, eh? That would be would be the tree. Um, but yeah, so well done to to Wrexham. I mean, Wrexham's a bit in the news with its, its football team these days and all the other things which are going on. <laughs> um, but no, well, it's put it's put on the map, hasn't it? Now for its uh, its celebrated Best. tree. Yeah, That's brilliant. Um, I mean, all the Almost five hundred years old. Well, yeah, well, no, well done. I mean, That's it's incredible, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. So, yews and oak trees live that long, but I never thought. I'd always thought sweet chestnuts were sort of. Mm. They're not softwood, but they're not quite as slow growing no, as indeed. some of the sort of no. hardwoods in this country. Yeah, are they, so. No, and I think maybe we should. You know, maybe it's a reminder that we perhaps we should grow more of them. Perhaps, mm. yeah, in the, in the scheme of things, especially if the fact they do produce something which we can enjoy Eating. as food. Yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. And I read recently there's some um, some other plants that have hit the news. Mm. Comfrey. Now, from memory, this was a old fashioned sort of skin remedy or uh, good for your bones or something, wasn't yes. it? But we used well, you kindly gave me a couple of plants to make some 
I'm going to call it fertilizer tea. I don't know what yeah, the proper yeah. name well, is it's for called it. Comf- yeah, comfrey tea. Yeah. Comfrey tea. Yeah, yeah it yeah, makes yeah, a lovely, yeah. you know, sort of nitrate rich. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Liquid, I guess yes. you call it, wasn't it? Liquid fertilizer. Yes, so. and very smelly it is, Peter. It's dis- mm. <laughs> disgusting. This this cooler summer's been quite good in the garden because at least it's kept the the smell down. But yeah, it's great stuff. And you basically just get all your all your leaves. Let let the plant put a lot of growth up in the spring. Let the flowers finish. The bees love it, of course. Mm, yeah, it's a very from. bee friendly plant. And, yeah, it grows from, well. It spreads like weeds. It some does. people say, doesn't it? It's it, it a good get, one. It gets quite invasive. It gets tall and then tends to fall over and flop over. So if it's in a border where you've got other plants you've got to be careful that it doesn't drown them but then just chop the whole plant back put it as i say into a into a bucket of water or you've got an old uh, a large container where you can just basically put the leaves in with some water keep that topped up and it makes the best brew of a comfrey tea mm-hmm. and it's uh, literally t- not even 10 percent, probably five percent to uh, to water so it's quite strong yeah yeah so you water it down once mm. you've, you've brewed it up you've brewed in your it. water bottle or wherever that's it yeah <laughs> and then, uh, and then yeah, apply it uh, to all, all your vegetables your flowers i mean I, I tend to use it on absolutely everything i also use it on my compost heap but to act as an activator okay. and that seems to help a little bit too wow. but um but no if you're using it around the garden it will go a long way and of course Brilliant. the plant will then produce more leaves um, often they don't produce a second flush of flowers, so you can cut the plants back again around about sort of September, and then, and then that's your comfrey tea for, for next win- next for, for winter. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what about this collection then? Mm. Where, who, who's been collecting it? So it's our good friends at uh, Garden Organics. They okay. Um, so they've got a, a twenty nine strong. Uh, basically different species of uh, of comfrey uh, which okay. they put into their their gardens which is all used for research so like we're, we're saying it's got a lot of a lot of incredible uses rich in plant nutrients such as nitrogen phosphorus and potassium and makes a potent organic fertilizer when steeped in water as we just as discussed just, yeah indeed <laughs> so it's good um and they the the uh, garden organics head gardener uh Emma O'Neill, she said they've been using comfrey on the site there for nearly 65 years. So, wow. Yeah. And their founder, of course, uh, Lawrence Hills, used to experiment with comfrey. And uh, so it's got a, it's got a, it's very deeply rooted at the uh, the headquarters at, uh, at, at Wright and up in the, up, up the road in from, from us here. So, oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. So, and ultimately, it's a mm. good, cheap way of. Mm. Getting yourself a nice good fertiliser. Exactly. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Purely, yeah, absolutely organic. It can't be any 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 less yeah. so. Yes. That's good. And a show I think we plugged a while back, mm. the Malvern show. Yes, the that's great awesome it. show. Yeah, yeah that, that's hit the headlines, hasn't it? It is. And um, yeah, eight will records. Uh, Guinness Book eight. Records. Eight. Yes, not just wow. one. <laughs> All in one show. That's in one pretty show. good. Yeah, I mean, th- this fixation we have with growing things in a big way, you know, it's just so it's so British, isn't it? It's so English. It's great. It is great, isn't it? Yeah. So six gardeners have made world record uh, books by uh, basically tabling an array of world-beating vegetables uh, with two of the season growers achieving the much prized accolade twice. I mean, gosh. Wow. Uh, so these were at the, the Canna UK uh, National Vegetable Championships at the, the Great Malvern Show, uh, the autumn show there. Yep. Um, and, uh, Peter Glazebrook, he triumphed with the heaviest bell pepper at uh, 0.75 gr- grams, kilograms? Kilograms, grams, yeah, kilograms. nearly a, a kilo, kilo, kilo pepper. yes. And the l- largest runner bean? Leaf, leaf, yes. It's a leaf, it's, it's a 63 leaf. 63 centimetres by 67 <laughs> centimetres, is that? That's huge, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's enormous. That's nearly a, 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 a leaf. A leaf, wow. yeah. I wonder what variety yeah. that was. <laughs> that was that's brilliant. Uh, I think with most of these uh, giant vegetables, they are their own raisings, their own seeds, so they're very precious. They're not. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. There's all oh, yes. It's, it's when you get. I, I don't know if it, did they have a prize beating pumpkin or because the, the world record for the biggest pumpkin is enormous. It is enormous. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that, that tends to go between America and the UK. I think we tend to. It tends to go between those, you know, these two countries, really. Mm, but um, you see them sort mm. of carting them around on yeah. pallets and oh, forklifts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Madness, yeah, isn't incredible. it? Incredible. And, and another, another few uh, stats, Peter. Yeah, the heaviest broad bean was uh, 192 grams. Right. And the longest broad bean 
43.1 centimetres. I mean, that's, yeah. That's, that would make a good long. meal. You I wouldn't need many of those to make a meal, would you? No, no. That'd be, no. That'd be great. Um, cool. Yep, yeah, so we, oh, yeah, we had the heaviest runner bean at 196. And uh, Joe Atherton, he had the longest loofer at 1.29 metres. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking... Thing. And the heaviest cucumber, 13.388 kilos, which is just... Absolutely mad, no madness, isn't it? Really, yes. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. That's good. So loofers, mm. I thought they were they liked a bit more of a warmer climate than you, we. Indeed, you're absolutely right, Peter. They need warmth. They need to be grown in a greenhouse or a polytunnel. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, but you get, can grow them in the UK. That's most, interesting. Most definitely. That, that's what you get as. I say the body shop used to sell mm. them as like body scrubbers. Yeah, back, back scrubbers. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So yeah. that is the that same. That is the same thing. Yeah, vegetable. Wow. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, okay. I think I think good old Monty Darman Gardeners World last year grew them quite successfully. So you know it is achievable with a, a bit of warmth. A bit of warmth. So yeah. maybe yeah. in a conservatory, like you say, the greenhouse, we yeah. could grow some indeed back scrubbers. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, Great stuff. And mm. any other. Uh, World records. Well, or? yes. So, as I mean, as we're, as we're recording that the podcast, uh, obviously we're, we're we're just into November, but uh, one yep. world record was was actually beat, was taken on board, and literally smashed ten thousand pumpkins and squashes created a, a wonderful mosaic display mm. over in uh, Sunnyfields Farm near Southampton. It's an impressive uh, yeah. sight, isn't yeah. it? Ten thousand pumpkins yeah. uh, and uh, yeah. squashes. I mean, it's a lovely. What do you call it? Like a mosaic, it's a mosaic isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And the, it, it's a great view. And it depicts Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, as we're yep. going to get to Christmas now. Very, fa- And it's, I think that's celebrating its 30th anniversary, so well-timed to, to plug that as well. And it, it basically depicts the, sun, uh, the moonlight stance of uh, Jack Skellington. And uh, they spent five hours manoeuvring all those... Uh, pumpkins and squashes in place, and uh, as I say, it's um, yeah, it's quite it amazing. Looks good. It yeah, looks it really does, good. It does so, look good. But they, they they were saying they did anticipate winning a world record. It just sort of happened that they they had that sort of number. Um, mm. But well done to them. Yeah, amazing. I mean, where do you get ten thousand pumpkins from? <laughs> yeah, well, they grow a lot on the farm, but uh, <laughs> and they said that none of the the, the pumpkins were going to be wasted. They'd be absolutely, absolutely processed for food, or they would be used for soups, or they would be used back into the soil. So. Fair enough. All upcycled. Yeah. And some really good news, isn't Mm. it, Chris? I mean, we learnt recently that, well, it was a long, it is the longest running gardening magazine. Mm. 139 years. It's been saved. It's been saved. It's amazing. Yeah, I was a bit, I, uh, I mean, I touched the social media when I heard that amateur gardening uh, was was going to be, you know, potentially cancelled. Um, but it's had a reprieve. Um, mm. The publishing company at Kelsey Media, they're okay. over in Kent. Uh, they've uh, they've taken it on and they're going to restructure it. It's going dis- to still going to be a, not around for another month or so. Well, actually, it'll be probably middle of November. So when people are listening to our podcast, it, it should will, be it back in the shops. Gaps, hopefully, yeah. it's changing its format. It won't be a weekly magazine. It'll go to fortnightly. Right, and the cover price will be going up from two pounds twenty to three pounds fifty. So, but the fact is, its heritage has been saved, and that's such, yeah. such good news. Um, but when we find out a little bit more about the contents and what's going to be in there, whether it's going to have a news pages, because obviously for a, for us creating a podcast, it's really useful that we get a, a good resource. I do mm. hope that Amateur Gardening does have more news in it again, so uh, we can we can give it a mention and a plug every so often. Brilliant. Well, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. And the results from the big butterfly count have mm. come in, haven't they? They have, and uh, it's quite interesting. More than 1.5 million butterflies and daytime flying moths were recorded, which is a record. Okay. And uh, certainly increase-wise, um, red amerals are my favourite butterfly. Yeah, I think. they're in lovely, pretty butterflies. Fantastic. Yeah, they increased in the UK, possibly due to climate change, the, uh, the article is suggesting. Uh, came in top for the first time with over 240... 8,000 recorded recorded sightings. Mm, so big numbers. Because they've been doing this now for 13 years, I read. It's yeah. quite a long-running survey, isn't it? It is, it's yeah. It's nice when the numbers are going up. I think some have gone down, mm-hmm. but then yeah. I guess that's the way it goes, isn't it? Some things go up, some things go down. But so long as there's still some butterflies and 
Mm, but Some are doing well. That's yeah, and I, I think and I think Peter, people are certainly certainly at the garden centre here. They're asking for lists of plants which are butterfly friendly. Mm. I mean, the usual bee friendly ones are, are quite easy to spot because they usually have a label with the, the plant for pollinators symbol on. But butterfly sometimes not so. So we do have a list of, of plants which we we give to customers to to guide them for creating a nice butterfly patch. Well, I in always the think of buddleias when of I course. Think, I, yeah. I, uh, interestingly, I. I a self-seeded one in um, a house in Northampton. Mm-hmm. Normally, they come out sort of quite deep purple. I'd yeah. say as yes. a flower. This one's pink, very pink. Oh, right. and it's self-seeded. I don't know where from, but yeah, from a bird. I, I, yes. I, I, I thought those sort of fancier ones were generally mm. sort of bred and grafted and cuttings yeah. taken off. Yeah, but this one think. is obviously a that's good, a natural one. Yeah. So mm. that's quite pleased with I that. Bet. That's really really good. So yeah, um, the charity, you know, basically suggesting that we should all be thinking about butterfly fruit, which I think we already are, you know, as gardeners, mm. we're, we're in tune with that. But, uh, yeah, it's good that, uh, you know, the Butterfly Watch continues to grow from strength to strength. Definitely. And Sandringham hits the news. Unfortunately, mm. their gardens haven't done very well this year, have they? Mm, no, King Peter. Charles has been... Well, he, he came up with a grand plan to rip out the lawn and put in a new topiary garden, That's wasn't it? it? Yep. With, I mean, topiaries are lovely and... By the sound of it, 5,000 odd yew trees were mm-hmm. planted and yes. 4,000 4, odd herbaceous perennials big numbers, as well. Big so old numbers for, to create this really uh, climate friendly garden. Yes. Mm, it must be a big lawn. I wish I had one that big that <laughs> yeah. I could fit 5,000 yew <laughs> trees in. But anyway, <laughs> no, I mean, at the end of the day, it's sad, isn't it? it? Is, when yeah. it doesn't matter who you are, whenever you plant something, mm, you want it to grow. Indeed. And I think this year, the weather hasn't. I been don't. great for planting, not, has it? No, if you think back, yeah, because this this was we, we reported on this back in July uh, on Digit, and yes, the um, there's some large specimen yew trees went in, big old specimens, and they obviously succumbed. Yeah, very hot June, wasn't it? So yep. maybe just that month in itself, um, you know, who could have you know anticipated that part of of uh, you know Sandringham? It's obviously quite uh, exposed, isn't it? Wind wise, um, it's quite flat area. Who, who knows, you know, moisture, irrigation, something obviously went awry there. But they are suggesting that uh, Thytophora uh, root uh, rot could be uh, could be the problem. It doesn't actually say that, but it sort of suggests that, yeah, you mm. can get that. But they usually only affect mature plants, not new mm. plants. So um, I wonder yeah. if they put any mycorrhiza in there. Cause I don't obviously know. The mm, root that works, plant, uh, plant works Plant works root grow, correct? Yeah, is the, what yeah. we recommend to yeah. put in with the natural mm. friendly fungus that help the roots. So mm. I wonder maybe if they did did or didn't use yeah. that because if they didn't, then maybe yeah. it was a yeah. Because well, I mean, yeah. from my understanding, that the the fight off for a it's a damp. Damp problem, isn't it? Yeah, yes, um, it's moisture. If, if, if the soil gets excessively wet and it doesn't dry out, you get very stagnated soil, and that unfortunately causes the the disease to move around the soil a lot more, you know, sporadically. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, honey fungus is a form of Thytophora. We know how that okay. how yeah. that moves through the soil very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, but maybe it was just as you say, just down to the weather and, and the, the conditions. But I'm sure. Uh, uh, you know, King Charles will just get a few new trays to to replace those, and everything will be be, yeah. will be good. But it, it is it is the bigger picture at the moment, isn't it, Peter? Of of plant health in our gardens, it is a mm. a concern. Um, as well, we're seeing. it's always the way, isn't it? They say mm. the first couple of years, whenever you put new trees in yeah. or bigger plants, plants, you've really got to take massive care of Most them definitely. to get yeah. them established. And yeah. then, yeah. once they've got their roots down, yeah. Off they go, Off they you go. don't have to worry about yeah. them so much. But and uh, yeah. I suppose as we're coming into the bare root season now as well, it's, it's, it's timely to, to make sure that you, yeah, you do your groundwork, get your preparation in, make mm. sure the air is nice and weed-free so there's no extra competition. And if, you, yeah, if, you, if you're planting something which, like roses, you're putting, I say, a new rose hedge in, you've had roses there before, yeah, a bit of mycorrhizal root grow would be good because that That's obviously it. means that you, you can Get your plant. trench dug now before yes. it gets too horrifically boggy and yes. or frozen. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I remember the mail order days where yeah, oh. you get the spade out and it's like you, yeah. you, you push down on the spade and your left hand foot's gone as deep into the mud as the spade <laughs> <Nice>. has. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and maybe just yeah, thinking about 
how deep you have to go. I mean, a, a good spade's depth is more than ample, isn't it, for, mm. for most things? You know, sometimes you see people digging out, you know, almost they're going to lay a, you know, um, you know, I don't know, a, a, a cable, you know, put some uh, yeah, yeah. Bro, you know, broadband fast like, <laughs> cabling down. You don't need that sort of depth. You know, a good spade's depth is absolutely fine. And uh, obviously work the soil wider rather than deeper. That's the, the general yes, advice we give and there. Incorporate your old compost mm. heap or some organic matter. Most, and most definitely. Sort of, yeah. uh, that, that'll help it get established. Uh, it's, um, well, hopefully King Charles will have more luck next year. Yep. And the gardens will be better Indeed. for him. Uh, Indeed. And some other sad news was um, Monty Don's... Nell has passed away. Yes, yeah, with a, after a battle with cancer. So, and that's just, I think it was three or four, yeah, three years after his other dog, um, Nigel, which obviously was a, a, a brute force of the, of the program. I mean, I mean, his dogs uh, and his current dog, I think Patty, uh, and uh, they are, you know, they are the star, stars of Gardener's World in a way. They, they seem to get into all the shots, and I think the cameramen definitely. Do enjoy, uh, the things. they're but photogenic they are, dogs. They I are very photogenic, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, Monty Don, I mean, he's written a book about his, his dogs. They are a very important part of his life, and uh, mm. that and his garden, you know, goes in hand in hand. And yes, I think social media was uh, ablaze with uh, outpourings uh, of, of you know, some beautiful comments, uh, of, you know, a few days ago, which obviously will be around. So it's, yeah, sad, sad news. But he has got a he has got a new a new dog in 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 tow, so he does That's like it. to have plenty on, yeah, the, on yeah. the way, yeah. Which is, I suppose, what you need to do in in that situation. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And a, a therapy garden, yes, has been awarded thousands by the lottery for a revamp. I mean, yeah. the lottery does such great work I mean, in the sense of funding them in the first place, mm. and now it's funding. It is quite often to refurb them as well. Yeah, which is uh, good. It is good. And this garden, Peter, is the centre at Kings Heath Park in Birmingham, which I know I remember as a youngster watching Pebble Mill at One, which was a sort of daytime program before daytime TV became a bit of a, a workhorse it is now. But they yep. used to have all their gardening from there as well. So it was a okay. big part. And uh, I think students at Pershaw College used the uh, the facilities too there, right, um, for various uh, trial and trial grounds and it was over the time um yes it was designed by people like john brooks dan pearson and obviously joe swift so it's had lots of you know good horticultural uh, factoring into its uh, success so to get this money and to give it a new lease of life is, is great news brilliant i see the hta horticultural trades association have been lobbying the government uh, yes this is really good news. So basically, there's the, a government inquiry at the moment into the future of horticultural education uh, in our schools. Okay. And the suggestion is, Peter, that perhaps at some point in not too near future, we might get uh, horticulture on the national curriculum, gardening. It's an interesting mm. sort of debate, isn't it? Because, I mean, obviously, biology, you do... Loads of stuff on... Oh, when we were at school, can yes, I say, I, Chris? Indeed. Um, yes. We did loads of stuff on photosynthesis and Lots plants of. making oxygen. And mm -hmm. I mean, you touched on the sort of science side of it. And obviously then mm. in horticultural college, you did like soil biology and yeah, more learnt depth. about fertilisers and mm. all sorts of things like that. And it's a massive... I mean, obviously for you and I, a massive sort of source of great learning and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that we've enjoyed learning about yeah, uh, yeah. but i think yeah for the general public and yeah. the general education system why not yeah I mean, I mean i think what they're trying to do is look at the 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 relationship between education and land-based industries so i mean this is yeah. the whole thing about getting people back into farming mm -hmm. you know especially now we're obviously out of the eu that we've got to be more efficient with our, our land and how we use it so that in itself would be good um, so we'll see, um, but it's getting quite a lot of interest. Uh, even um, of sort of top file actors are getting into the <laughs> equation as well. So we've got a quote from the uh, one of the stars of Downton Abbey, who plays uh, Jim, a chap called Jim Carter, who is a very keen gardener. Mm. He plays uh, Charles Carson in the uh, in the period drama, and he's he's quoted that uh, we should have less screen time, more green time. And I think that sort of sums it up, isn't it? We That's a good get... thing. I might introduce that to my children. Yes, Less that's green good. time, more green, green time. time. Yeah, Does that go. mean I can get them to mow the lawn now as well? That's brilliant. <laughs> yes, I like that. Yes. Uh, no, in all seriousness, yeah. mm, uh, it's great. Uh, I think yeah. when you do 
from a well, as we we know, mm. from a mental health side of things, exactly. it, yes. it's a positive thing to do. Yes, physically, mm. it's it's hard good. Work. It's also good. It's hard work, but it <laughs> keeps you fit. And yeah. it's nice just getting out in the fresh air. Yeah, and, and appreciating nature and, and using the areas. Yeah, as an outside gym, you know, it's, it's, mm. it's cheaper than a subscription, isn't it? Definitely. No, I, I'm well behind this one. I think that's yeah. a really good, good article. And now we're going to have a chat with an old friend of the podcast, mm. one of our celebrity journalist friends, yes, I suppose indeed, we yeah. should call her, indeed. really, shouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to catch up on this podcast with Jane Perone, and who was a guest on Dig It back in December 2021. Jane has a popular houseplant podcast called On The Ledge, and since we last spoke to Jane, I believe you've been busy with the publication of a book, Legends of the Leaf, and today... You have a new exciting project, which uh, I know you're excited to share with us. So good good morning, Jane. Hi there. So the houseplant gardener in a box, it's it's certainly very different to the, the sort of normal sort of gardening books and uh, information we get through the uh, through the, the bookshops and such like. So could you tell us a little bit how the, the, the concept, uh, uh, how it arrived, how you arrived at it? Well, this was something that um, I was approached to get involved in this project, and I immediately said yes, because I don't know about you, you're, whether you're as old as me, but whether you can remember back to the 70s and 80s, but cards, boxes of cards for different things was a thing. Um, and I found, in fact, I've got a set of um, houseplant cards from the, from the 70s, and I love the idea of, of reinvigorating this idea of a box of cards about plants because it's just such a tactile kind of format each card has a beautiful illustration and then on one side and then on the other side words from me which give you a kind of summary of the plant how to grow it and where to put it and i just love the idea that you could use these cards in different ways yes you can use them as a reference but you can also display them on a wall or um you know ha do that use them in different ways um and i also think it makes a lovely gift as well probably a gift that you're going to buy for yourself to be honest but <laughs> <laughs> a referencing and something that also just looks delightful and you could uh, certainly frame up some of these beautiful illustrations by the illustrator cody bond and have them on the wall as well that's a good idea, yeah, because uh, I, I was thinking uh, it, you'd be able to use them as a little way of sort of read all of the cards and then you can work out which ones you think might be suitable and good for you. And then you can use them as like your own personal collection and tick them off as you, you know, find the plants in the garden centre. But yeah, it's a brilliant concept. I, I love it. And I think we, we were chatting before, yeah. Peter. We, we, we were saying about the this sort of card system back in the the, the 70s and 80s was uh, sort of recipe, food recipes were, were were often put on this sort of format. And uh, it was a very good way of, of, of uh, well, yeah, collecting and, and uh, referencing, um, obviously, menus and dishes and uh, food dishes. So why not with, with houseplants? Exactly. And the nice thing is, is that the cards are arranged under different categories. So... You know, if you are a lover of succulents, you can head straight to that section. But you, as you say, you could also, you know, pick out various cards and compare them side by side and look at their growing conditions. And that can help you to figure out what plants might work well together and what else to try. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's something that hopefully people will tap into. And it's just something a bit different from a book. I think, you know, with um, our attention spans being ever shorter, this is just another fun way to engage with houseplants if maybe you might find that you don't have time to, to go <laughs> go and read my book. <laughs> <laughs> and can I ask, Jane, how did you sort of decide on which plants to get in the box? Because now on our previous podcast, I know we found out your love and passion for a Christmas plant called a Ponsettia. And um, we were really surprised that managed to make it into the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. In this, in my book, I was, I kind of felt like I was able to uh, have my own uh, unique and probably quirky selection of twenty-five house plants that I counted as iconic that I wanted to write about. But I yeah. think these cards are serving a bit of a different purpose. I'm not necessarily dictating to people, you know, this is the plant you should be growing, but actually 
poinsettias are sold by the million. Mm. So you've got to kind of take into account and realise that whether or not I would buy one, lots of people are buying this plant and wanting to know to, how to look after it. So it's important to include not just my own personal preferences, but things that actually reflect what people are buying. And rightly or wrongly, people buy a lot of poinsettias. So I felt like it was important to have that one in there. But I know what you mean. I mean, everyone's got a story about, you know, somebody who, um, you know, has this incredibly difficult plant that for them just performs really, really well and is easy and then vice versa. So, you know, it's a very tricky thing to come up with a list of 60 plants, but I did my best to kind of represent across the different realm of houseplants things that people would like to grow and, you know, enjoy growing and get pleasure out of. Yeah. I think you've done very well. I mean, like you say, you've you know, sort of categorised them into the different sort of sections, and it's a, a nice selection of plants. Definitely, and hopefully, inspire people. Yeah, and, and, and uh, Jane, the the artwork, um, the the actual um, the, the, the the paintings of the the plants, they work really well too. It's it's a, it's slightly sort of retro, isn't it, in the in the way they've been put uh, together. Yeah, I think the illustrations really add something. And I I mean, from my, my previous, my book was illustrated as well. So I do love an illustration. And I think, you know, a photo can, can say so much. But I think an illustration, as I say, it gives the cards another element that it, you're sort of enjoying an artwork as well as a, a, a reference, a piece of reference. Mm. Um, so I think that, that's rather nice and it gives it a different kind of feel um and cody bond the illustrator has done a great job on on those illustrations yeah most definitely um jane before we we, we leave you this houseplant garden in a book uh where could our uh dig it listeners uh, uh find it well it's uh, as they always say available in all good bookstores it is also being stocked in some houseplant shops and should be in garden centers as well it's published by skittle dog which is an imprint of thames and hudson so it's should be widely available and um, also available in if you have any international listeners it should be available um in most uh house plants uh, in most shops around the world actually it's got a global distribution i hope um so yeah should be able to pick it up i think it's one of those things that will also probably end up being sold in gift shops and things like that because it's one of those things that might make a nice little Christmas stocking for I us. I think Definitely. it looks like yeah. a lovely present uh, to give someone. Yeah. It's great. P- perfectly timed as we come up to, to Christmas as well, Jane. Well, thank you very much for, for your time today and, and the very best of luck with Houseplant Garner in a box. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank Thanks, then. Thank Bye-bye. You, thank you. And now time for, well, soft fruits. Brings my thoughts back to the summer. Mm. When you say soft fruit to me, I just think strawberries. You've got strawberries, yeah. Well, strawberries and raspberries, my favourite two Absolutely. types of fruit. Yeah, two, two of the best. And this is our, uh, our Dig It Top 5 um, of okay. soft fruit sales this year. So, yeah. And I thought it'd be quite nice, just to, it's timely really, because we're into, into November. The, uh, the, the runners of strawberries will be coming to the garden centre any day soon and we'll obviously be dispatching yeah, those out. It's time to plant them up, isn't it? It and is, get the, yeah. The cheap, cheap strawberries, Street which is always a good one for, for me. Indeed, and you can obviously get some nice new varieties. So, uh, in reverse order, uh, number five, Black Currant, Big Ben. Okay. Um, obviously an improvement on, you know, the the, uh, the Ben range, but uh, certainly popular. Um, that one we grow in a pot. It's not bare-rooted, but it's a good, good variety if you just want one Black currant, that's a good black currant, yeah. yeah. I always find them a bit sour. Mm, they, need I don't, they need a good load of sugar they in them. Do, for, but <laughs> whether I, you're I allowed to, to put sugar in them these days, oh, I don't can. know. Yeah, if you make it, I love preserves, though. Black currant. Yeah. Black currant jam. Present. Oh, yes. That's, and that's I think that's yeah. it. And Ribena. Oh, Ribena. Uh, yeah, indeed. I don't know whether you could make Ribena out of Big Ben, mm, but. I, I suspect you probably <laughs> could. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then number four. It is a strawberry. It's Happel, um, okay. which is a, a summer cropper. Yeah, it's a good one. It I like it. I've grown yeah. it. Yep. Uh, number three. Um, now we're <laughs> we're looking at other berries. This is blueberry, and this right. is sunshine blue. Okay. So sunshine blue is a little bit different to the other varieties of blueberries we sell. This is um, uh, basically self fertile, so you only need ah, one. Okay, that's good. And it's evergreen, so you don't get the wonderful autumn colour on them, which you do with the other ones. It holds its leaves as well. So good for small gardens on the balconies and where you, you are limited for space. And it's a good cropper as well. So mm. that's uh, I think blueberries th- can be mm. divine when they're really nice, sweet blueberries. Are, yeah. 
I'm if not, they've had the sunshine, which, as I'm guessing, this one needs, as it's called they, sunshine they, blue. They did, <laughs> yeah. And it's a, such a good one, you know. If you've got you've got, you've got children, grandchildren to grow, mm. if you want to introduce them, you know, to to growing fruit rather with your strawberry, it, you know, blueberries are really good, and of course you can just eat them straight off the plant, can't you? And or put them onto cereals and such like. So, mm. big thumbs up for for blueberry sunshine blue, and number two. Uh, strawberry Cambridge favourite. Mm. Well, you know, it's it's the traditional variety that's been around. It is for, a favourite, and it, it makes a lovely strawberry. It does indeed, and Can't uh, go wrong with uh, it. indeed, yeah, totally. And strawberry, and number one position is red gauntlet. Okay, which again is another good commercial variety, but hey, it's got fantastic flavour and good size fruits as well. So, okay, I've not grown that one yet. Yeah. Maybe I should have a go with that one. Yeah, that's I, a good idea. I, and that was new to us last season. So, yeah, okay, it's, it's obviously. Proved its its value and uh, it's, it's, it's done very very well. One. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So uh, plenty to look forward to and uh, yeah, soft root season. Yeah, you just love you, you love just getting on with planting because you you know you're going to get a crop. You know, in 2024, that's the great virtue with all these varieties. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And I guess it's that time of the show where. You give Ooh. us our list of jobs that we need to start getting on I with, Chris. I know, and I'm, I'm sorry, Peter, the, 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 the job list may be going down, but the, the content <laughs> seems to be increasing. Um, yeah, I mean, we're into, into November, so there's a few things which you can give a trim back to. I'm thinking about things which are going to get blown over in the, in the, in the, in the gales. Yep. Um, so if you've got, like, Budleys, we were chatting about Budleys, um, your, your Lavatera, uh, if you've got Lavatera, wonderful pink flowers, all those things need to be cut down by half so you reduce okay. the height yep. um, and that prevents the wind rock and obviously deepens the appearance of the plants uh, obviously we time to get planting if you're putting in a new new hedge or some new um, you want some new shrubs in uh, you know it's been a really good autumn so far for, for autumn planting yep. certainly um, so go with the weather and uh, if you are putting things in which are you're in an exposed location, maybe think about getting some windbreak netting just to slow the uh, slow the wind speed around your plants, especially evergreen plants. If you're putting you in this month and in through the winter, you obviously has a lot of foliage on it. So just putting something just to help to baffle the wind to reduce the wind speed that yeah. might help to to establish. And the plant can you stuff. do the same thing with fleece? So if you've got some old fleece, if you've got like a new hedge or something that you're yes. trying to protect, you could, rather than putting windbreak netting up, you could just use some old fleece. You could indeed. I would probably say is perhaps do it sort of two thicknesses thick to, to, okay. help, to help baffle it, but no, absolutely fine. It's obviously a lot thinner, so if we did get some really strong winds, it could get down. But oh, yeah, you, I suppose it's more likely to blow off, but yeah, equally, yeah. at least it would give some, some protection. It would indeed, you... yeah. yeah. And, and obviously use you know fleece as a, as a floating cloche, so if you are growing some vegetable plants or strawberries especially you know you just newly planted some strawberries um putting that over might help to protect them as they establish for a first you know the first few weeks especially yep. if, if the wind chill gets you know gets really really cold too um obviously november is my favorite month for planting tulips and uh, the garden yes. center you know is bound to have a few left so you know grab some um and get those in yeah um the reason for planting them late is that you avoid the, the tulip virus um which can affect them if they start to grow in sort of september and october so we're doing it for a good reason we're trying to help protect the bull from disease okay um and obviously you can you can multi-plant those by lasagna planting or layer planting your tulips if you want and of course if you're doing your pots then you'll probably still need some bedding to put in there so yep pansies you know, are looking good at the moment aren't looking, they they're looking nice aren't they yes yeah. and we've been getting some of the the very dwarf growing wallflowers called sugar rush okay which comes into f when it comes into the garden center it's in flower so right. normally with wallflowers you have to wait till march april next year with this type of wallflower you actually buy it in in, a, in color and it carries on flowering through the winter and then it gives you its best display in the spring so that's a ah. really good variety okay. to, to look out for that's uh, wallflower sugar rush uh, as well there and um yeah and if you're doing any pots as well um yeah do do some nice Nice mix, my, my silver grow multi purpose mix with twenty percent organic blended topsoil is what I'm I'm sticking to now. It seems to work very well. And okay. uh, all right, it adds a few pennies onto your compost, but at least it holds the moisture well mm. in the in the summer, which is, is obviously yeah, important it's what as we well. Need, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I suppose there's a bit of a debate, Peter, about whether you take out all your old compost for bulbs or you just basically reinvigorate the compost in your pots from the summer. Um I yeah, it it does depend how much root is in the in the pots. If it's really pot, 
you know, if you so can bound, bound yeah. yeah, then maybe remove that. But certainly, you know, for, for bulbs, they're already pre-programmed to flower. So, so long as they're in a compost which will hold moisture and drain well, you should be absolutely fine. But, uh, yeah, sometimes using a little bit of fresh compost in there just will, will help. Okay, good idea. And ponds, I suppose, mm. is that time of the year, isn't it, where we pull back all the... Marginal plants, yes. chop them up so the deadly, uh, so the dying off foliage doesn't go into the pond and just <laughs> rot down. And same with the water lilies, if they're starting to sort mm. of die off, pull it. You can pull them up and you know, chop the you know, chop the big leaves off, and possibly you know, think about the winter frosts, which yeah. won't be long now, will no, it? Indeed, it is no. sort of, if you've got a pond pump in the pond, lift it up to closer to the surface so that it's only circulating the water on the top, which leaves the warm water on the bottom. And, yeah, I guess if you're feeding your fish, move them over onto a, a, win- a wheat germ food okay. um, whilst it, the water is still sort of warm enough. But when it goes below 8 degrees or 5, no, certainly below 5, don't bother feeding them at no, all. Mm-hmm. Um, 8 degrees is generally where I'd stop but everyone has their own different ideas. But the wheat germ foods are much more easily digestible food for them, so it, it shouldn't clog them up too much. Um, and, yeah, if you do get a early frost and the water surface gets covered in ice, I always used to use just a hot saucepan of, uh, of hot water, mm-hmm. um, stick that on the surface of the ice, that'll generally melt its way through fairly quickly, and then you just come, uh, come and take that off and... They've got an air gap, That's which what they need, is what they, they need in yeah, the, yeah. If, if it does get covered up. But yeah. this time of year, it's not going to get too cold, hopefully, yet. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> the month we'll of November. We'll wait and see. Who yeah. can tell with the weather? Oh, that's really good, yeah. Lot, lots to think about for our ponds. And, of course, thinking about the the, the, uh, the frost, then, obviously, yeah, in our greenhouses. Um, mm, bubble um, wrap. Uh, bubble wrap, yeah. Good old uh, insulation, making sure your, your greenhouse is nice and clean beforehand. And, obviously, if you're bringing your plants in, yeah, a bit of fleece to give them a bit of extra protection as well um, I've got a few plants which are still outside and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, I'm watching the weather very carefully but whilst they're outside they seem to perform a lot better a lot of plants at the moment before you start bringing them in because obviously they, they start to shut down which means that you know leaves have to be removed as they as they potentially start to get uh, botrytis and things so yep. keep them tidy as well um, also, which I need to do with mine, I don't know about yours, Peter, but yeah, go on furniture, make sure the cushions are all in and uh, make sure you've got a, a cover to put over your your your, 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 your yeah, Well, your I covered furniture. the trampoline last week. Oh, right. Okay. I'm ahead of the game on this oh, one, Chris. <laughs> I, I checked with the children first and they're like, they're, yeah, cool. all right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, thankfully my garden furniture is the textiline sort of plastic yeah. um, woven stuff, <laughs> so... It yeah. doesn't have any cushions and it's it can stay yeah, out all year round. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think if you've got yeah. a nice wooden furniture set or a mm. sort of like you say cushioned, take yeah, them inside. inside yeah, make sure they're nice dry. and dry before you bring them in, and uh, just make it. sure your area is completely rodent free as well, because mm. that happened to to our gone furniture oh, set no. a couple of years ago. Yeah, we you opened up in the spring and uh, we had, had a few visitors. Michael and Mouse has been yeah, enjoying big, wintering yeah, in the cushions. He, he was yeah. really taking the Mickey out of our garden <laughs> furniture. That was for sure so it was a bit of an expensive replacement job uh, as well worse. yeah so um for production of things though broad beans you can start sowing those now mm. um, yeah we did sweet peas yeah. last month but onions shallots get them in the ground yeah, as yeah, well yeah we've still got a bit of time to not do that not too late is no, it but yeah sooner all. rather than later if you can yeah but if you've got yeah broad beans if you've got a cold frame or a cold greenhouse get those going and just grow them really gently don't you don't you're not going to wanting excessive amounts of growth just nice steady growth so you'll have some nice plants to put out next uh, february yep. time as well which would be good um, obviously, November we, we leaves have dropped. As soon as the leaves drop, you can start doing any winter pruning of your your apples and pear trees. So okay. the three Ds: dead, disease, damaged wood. Make sure they're taken out. And of course, when the plant's got no leaves on the tree, you can see what you're doing, which is yep. so much better than, than summer pruning. So, yeah, have a plan of action. Maybe thin out a little bit of the growth of, of some of your, your plants to uh, let a bit of light in, which is well, it's getting which is air better. in, isn't it? it? Is, that, isn't yeah. that the saying with That's apple it. trees? You want yep. to cut them so they can, they have a nice breathing space in That's between. It the branches yeah. yeah and there was well, my college days it was say you know the, the shape of the tree needs to look like a, a wine glass sort of so sort of very yep. open size so yeah just go along and uh, yeah it's not a bad thing to be thinking about when you're pruning your uh, your apples and pears 
the other thing well, we're into you've got obviously sort of six well four four weeks you know potentially to to christmas so you can start thinking about things like narcissi the paper whites um so they can be started off either in some bull fiber or you might want to grow them on uh, on some gravel uh, or in containers where you can see the roots coming through which can be okay. a bit fun great, yeah. great for the kids to to see that um so they'll be in flower uh, for so christmas. that's for getting them for christmas, for christmas isn't it yeah, that's so not for planting out no later. This is you, do, you, you just plant the bulbs straight into the ground if you want them for indeed. spring, spring bulbs. Yeah, but if you yeah. want to get them ready for christmas yeah yeah. Give them a nice warm start. Warm start, yeah. The paper whites are they're usually slightly well prepared, so they've got a little bit of he- they've had a bit of heat treatment to give them the impression they've had winter. So as soon as you put them into some compost, they should start growing really, really well too. Um, okay. Other things, I mean, to think about. I mean, if you are allowed to, it's a bit, it's a bit of a, a bit of a debate, isn't it, about bonfires? But um, mm. yeah, if you can and you want to dispose of debris, then obviously material you, which is diseased or infected, yeah, either yeah, brown bin option or, or to to incinerate. But obviously, yep. take um. take heed on the, your local authorities' permission to do that. Putting grease bands on as well. That's something I have got to do. It's on my yep, list. Caterpillar. Yeah. Anti caterpillars for the mm. moths, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, and yeah, uh, they can they can go there. They all do that. And things like raising your 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 um, pots on your deck and your patio off the floor as well. So pot that's a feet. Good point. Yeah, get the yeah. pot feet in. Mm. Yes. And, um, like, yeah, you don't know. It's so annoying when you get a really hard frost and it freezes the bottom of the terracotta pot and yep. it just you lift it up in the spring and the base stays behind. <laughs> yeah, not good. Yeah. No, it's surprise, surprise. I've done that, Chris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's up to all of us doesn't it it's very frustrating yeah. and uh it obviously it allows the air to get through to the the base too as well um of course we've got planting season yeah raspberries are obviously will be here they come from scotland so they need to be planted nice and early um they don't like to be hanging around do raspberry cane so okay. get them in yep. nice and early they don't like excessively wet soil so if your soil is on the moist side then a bit of grit or a bit of planting compost to help the drainage around those canes when you put them in and make sure you cut them hard back yep. that's essential with uh, with with all canes uh, cane fruit um so those are those are the main things and then maybe um finally on, on the the lawns it's, if we've not been able to get onto the lawn through the the early part of the autumn then now's a good time to do a bit of repairing um i noticed we've got a really good range of um grocery uh, repair lawn repair kits in the in the shop now they've seemed to okay. have increased as well as the good old uh, uh, patch magic products as well so so we're not too late for autumn no. feed and weed are we no again well, what's not feed and weed is it it's autumn lawn feed, well, lawn feed it yes. doesn't have the weed killer in That's it, it from yes, memory so, yeah so uh, but uh, that uh, gives it a good is it phosphate and phosphates yeah so it's, it boosts it's, the roots that's it yeah it's all about hardening the lawn up for the winter and giving it a bit of a, a bit of a last minute hit of, of nutrients in a positive way without in, ensuring lots of leafy growth at the well, expense I must say, my lawn this year has mm. been well, i mean the summer wasn't great for the lawn it went a bit yellow and mm. because i didn't particularly irrigate it it did die back but mm. finally mm. seems mm. to have gone yes. green again now Good. so maybe i should give it a bit of a Feed an feed, autumn feed, feed yes, yeah. or a bit of overseeding, Peter. If it's a bit, yeah, there's a few gaps in the spaces, then that's a good idea. A bit, yeah. of, a bit of an overseed as well, too. So, uh, cool. plenty to, to keep us going through the month of, of November. Brilliant, yeah. Can't believe not long till Christmas. Chris. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> <that's fairly. laughs> that'll and be next month, that'll won't be next it? Month. It will. Um, let's just do a quick, yeah, quick heads up for our, our next podcast piece. We've got uh, mm, Manus Glanus. interesting, isn't it? I Manus. Chatting to us about yes. terrarium. Yes, yes. So uh, that's something to look forward to, especially with Christmas in mind. Uh, make yeah, awesome nice presents. presents. I mean, it, presents. I think yeah. it's one of those things that you can either give it just as a terrarium mm. or so much nicer if you plant it up yeah. and give it to someone as a ready to go and, and personalize it as well yeah, put something in there. Yeah, yeah yeah make it something sort of special for them yes. put a nice wine glass with yeah. one of those helixine mm-hmm. growing over the edge i yes. think that can i mean helixines grow well in ter- yes. terrariums as manos tells us mm. about as well as yeah. those ones beginning with p that 
a variegated, yeah. what are they called? Uh, uh, pi- yeah, pileas, and he was peperomias. Those peperomias. Those are, I mean, yeah. they, you get that the lovely fit- dark yeah. Oh, yeah. sort of leaf with the red mm. veins. I think yeah. they're amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. And, add, and adding things to them as well, um, I was looking through one of the, the colour supplements the other day, and uh, somebody had done a, a basically a Jurassic Park themed okay. with, with little dinosaurs in. I thought that was Brilliant. really good. Yeah, so... Yeah, your imagination can run right, and great, great to get involved with the, with the children as well. Without a doubt, and like you say, something that makes people laugh. I yes. think, yeah, you yeah. can uh, if you know someone loves dinosaurs, like mm-hmm. they're yeah. a the young child and they like dinosaurs. Yeah, put a dinosaur or in it, or, or maybe a, a Lego character. That's it. That's yeah. A, yeah. It's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Brilliant. Good stuff. Okay, Chris. Well, well thank you very much pleasure. as always. No, thank you, Peter. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.